A week ago, the Wall Street Journal published an article that alleged a high level of dysfunction in Apple's design department. From Tim Cook's relationship with Johnny Ive to how Johnny Ive ran or didn't run the design organization itself and how all of that led to Johnny Ive's departure. The following evening, Tim Cook emailed NBC to call the story absurd, distorted, and not recognizable as the company it claimed to describe. And ever since, we've seen so many tea quotes, so many hot takes, so many sides taken, and it's exhausting. I'm exhausted and I do this for a living. I can't even imagine how tired and over it all you all are now. But we haven't seen any real progress either. The Wall Street Journal is sticking by its story, and a week later, it's continuing to promote it with blurbs like, why hasn't Apple had a hit product in years? A look at the internal drama around the departure of its design chief helps explain. For their part, Apple hasn't elaborated any further either. Neely Patel, editor-in-chief of The Verge, has said he thinks every word of the piece is true and well-reported, even if he doesn't think change is bad. Matthew Panzerino, editor-in-chief of TechCrunch, said bits and pieces in the various stories over the past few days are, as he understands them, not accurate or represented in an accurate context. And of course, since this is the internet, People who delighted in the accounts have been labeled as haters, and those who recoiled at them dismissed as apologists. But neither the original journal story nor Cook's retort provide enough context to reconcile these two radically different points of view. So rather than punish the world with yet another tea spill or hot take, I'm gonna try something different. A cool take, that's right, frozen. Hit subscribe, sucker punch that bell gizmo so you don't miss the next video, and then let's get into it. I'm Rene Ritchie, and this is Vector. According to the Wall Street Journal, as the deadline loomed for the 10th anniversary iPhone, Apple Inc.'s top software designers gathered in the penthouse of an exclusive San Francisco club called The Battery. Apple, like other companies, routinely holds off sites. They're meant to get teams together outside the distractions of the main offices to focus on specific projects, everything from brainstorming ideas to setting deliverables to presenting to executives. Sometimes they're held nearby in South Bay, sometimes in the city, sometimes much further away. Johnny Ive lived in San Francisco. So did a lot of the designers. Back to the Wall Street Journal. They had been summoned some 50 miles from the company's Cupertino, California headquarters to demonstrate planned features of the product to Johnny Ive, Apple's design chief, who seldom came to the office anymore from his San Francisco home. Steve Jobs used to work with Johnny Ive on industrial design and Scott Forstall on iOS software, which included Greg Christie's human interface team. When Steve passed away, Johnny couldn't work with Scott Forstall at all. So long story short, Scott ended up leaving Apple and Johnny ended up taking over design responsibility for software as well. That included iOS 7, which was a complete redesign turned around in nine months, less time than most incremental updates, but also on Apple Watch, an all new product that Johnny Ive threw himself into to the point of mental and physical exhaustion. When the watch finally shipped, something had to change. Managing the much larger human interface team was a lot more work than collaborating with the much smaller industrial design team. And traveling back and forth from Pacifica to Cupertino each day had become increasingly frustrating given the increased demands on his time. Not having to deal with the day-to-day -day management of the new unified design team and not having to deal with the commute to infinite loop, especially as his attention shifted to working on Apple Park and Apple Retail, which weren't at infinite loop anyway, were seen as ways to give Ive back some of his own design time. From the Wall Street Journal. For nearly three hours on that afternoon in January 2017, the group of about 20 designers stood around waiting for Mr. Ive to show, according to people familiar with the episode. After he arrived and listened to the presentations, he left without ruling on their key questions, leaving attendees frustrated. There were certainly big decisions to be made for iPhone X, like would it use a digital home button on the bottom of the screen for familiarity's sake, or would it risk an entirely new gesture-based navigation system? But it's hard to tell what to make of this story. Why arrive three hours late rather than not go at all? Why listen to the presentations and not provide feedback rather than not listen at all? This is all stuff the story makes me wanna know and then doesn't give me answers for. 
The Wall Street Journal. The episode was emblematic of a widening disconnect at the top of Apple. That invisible outside the company was eroding the product magic created by Mr. Ive and the late Steve Jobs that helped turn Apple into America's preeminent corporation. The episode, if accurate, talks about how Ive interacted with his human interface team, but doesn't reference the top of Apple at all. And I say if accurate because TechCrunch's Matthew Panzerino said, but the more important point is that no one I know felt that Johnny had checked out or abandoned the team. And for what it's worth, no one that I know felt that way either. As to the product magic of Ive and Jobs, they certainly collaborated on a staggering number of iconic products, from the iMac to the iBook, the iPod and iPhone to the iPad, the titanium PowerBook to the wedge-shaped MacBook Air. Also, some misses, like the G4 Cube, iPod Hi-Fi, Fatty Nano, Buttonless Shuffle, the iPhone 4 antenna, and basically every mouse ever. But Steve Jobs died in 2011. That's not an erosion, that's an ending. Everything Johnny and Apple have done since, both magic and tragic, have been the result of something new, something different. From the Wall Street Journal. Few on the outside knew that for years, Mr. Ive had been growing more distant from Apple's leadership, say people close to the company. Mr. Jobs' protege and Apple's closest thing to a living embodiment of his spirit grew frustrated inside a more operations-focused company led by chief executive Tim Cook. Johnny Ive was Apple's leadership. Steve Jobs had a few protégés, in a way one for each facet of his intense interests. Ive for hardware design, Forrestal for software, Tim Cook for Apple itself as a product. Jobs was the glue that had held them all together, but post-Jobs, they had to all find their own relationships. And operations were always a function of design at Apple, like we went over in the show last week with former Apple designer Mei Li. You can't separate the two. You can't just make a drawing or CNC a part and expect a hundred million of them to just manufacture themselves. As she said, People do not realize machines had to be invented and molecules had to be rearranged in order to support a great design. When materials were hard to come by or change in the last minute, or yields weren't as high as they needed to be, operations is what made sure they still shipped in days or weeks or months rather than weeks or months or years or never. Look no further than the delays we've seen with some Apple products, even after announcements over the last few years. If anything, there's an argument to be made that Apple needs more operations focus at the company. Steve Jobs made sure Johnny and design had almost unlimited power at Apple. You can see it in iOS 7, in the 18 karat gold Apple Watch, in the design by Apple in California book. But even then, operations is what enabled that gold watch and those printed pages to ship, same as they had during the Jobs era with products like the iPhone and iPad. According to the Wall Street Journal, Mr. Ive, 52, withdrew from routine management of Apple's elite design team, leaving it rudderless, increasingly inefficient, and ultimately weakened by a string of departures people close to the company say. Before he passed away in 2011, Steve Jobs, the man who usually made every decision about everything he cared about at Apple, went on several medical leaves. During those times, he stayed as involved as he could, but he also trusted people he trusted to make those decisions when he couldn't. People like Cook, Ive, and Forrestal. Even when he was there, Jobs trusted people like Phil Schiller and Eddie Q enough to let them do things he himself was initially against, like put iTunes and Safari on Windows and make the iPad mini. Part of Apple's culture, the part that mitigates them against ever being really rudderless, is having people responsible for everything important. People who might want and value sign-offs when they can get them, but who also know how to ship without them when and if they have to as well. That's why, when I withdrew from routine management, he left them intentionally ruddered with new vice presidents. Industrial design with longtime team member Richard Howarth, and human interface with Alan Dye, who I've had brought over from the graphic design group to spearhead the new look of iOS 7, yeah, rankling a lot of feathers along the way. One look at how many versions of iOS, watchOS, and versions of the iPhone and iPad hardware, and more recently, even Mac hardware that have shipped during the last few years shows that that culture is still alive and well. From the Wall Street Journal. The internal drama explains a lot about Apple's dilemma. It's one major new product of the post-Jobs era, the Apple Watch, made its debut five years ago. I'm not sure what drama is explaining what dilemma. Apple is a profoundly different company than it was a decade ago. One of the other things Steve Jobs did before he passed away was begin recruiting chip makers into Apple, including Johnny Ceruji, who now runs platform hardware. 
Over the last 10 years, we've gone from Macs using commodity components, distinguished from commodity PCs by their hardware and software aesthetics alone, to iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches, and more that run almost entirely on completely distinguished custom components. John Gruber and Ben Thompson spoke about this at length last week. Link in the description. But what didn't change so much is Apple's cadence when it comes to major new products. The iMac debuted in 1993. It wasn't a new category, but a modern reinterpretation of the all-in-one Steve Jobs introduced back in 1984, after, sure, first introducing the Lisa in 83. The iPod debuted in 2001, 17 years after the Mac and eight years after the iMac. The iPhone and iPad both spun out of Project Experience Purple, debuted in 2007 and 2010, some six and nine years after the iPod respectively. The post-jobs era started in 2011. The Apple Watch shipped in 2015, roughly eight and five years after the iPhone and iPad respectively. AirPods debuted in 2016, around a year after the Apple Watch. The HomePod debuted in 2017, about a year after that, and we can certainly argue its majorness, but it is a category Apple was accused of completely missing out on up until the moment of its launch. Then there's Apple's augmented reality glasses, which rumor has it will debut sometime next year or the year after. Their automotive efforts, if they don't ultimately choose to shelve them like they did the television set sometime after that. You could certainly include the Titanium PowerBook, which set the standard for Apple's laptops, and the 2008 MacBook Air, which redefined all modern laptops in the Jobs era list, and the 2019 Pro Display XDR, which seeks to redefine the reference monitor in the post-Jobs list. Maybe the 2015 Apple Pencil as well. Like in the Jobs years, there were misses as well. HomePod, I just mentioned. The butterfly keyboards, obviously. The 2013 Mac Pro. The years without Mac updates. Still, every mouse ever. I'm not sure speed between major products is the best measure, but for the sake of context and how Apple fits into the industry at large, I can't think of many or any other company that's managed to put together a string of products with bigger cultural impact over as long a period of time and is still always asked, what's next? Back to the Wall Street Journal. Its iPhone business is faltering, and more recent releases like its wireless AirPods haven't been enough to shore up falling sales. It hasn't had a mega hit new product since the iPad that started selling in 2010. The Apple Watch released in 2016 had the second biggest acceleration of any product in Apple's history, behind only the iPad. AirPods may not retail at a high enough price to move the revenue needle as much, but they've been so successful they've become a meme. And like the iPod and iPhone before them, they're shaping the next generation of products in their category. Combining the two, Apple has said the revenue for wearables is already 50% more than iPod was at its peak. I know that's not iPhone money, but really, nothing is. Take away the massive distortion and seemingly mass confusion of one of the most profitable products in history, and you see Apple's other businesses are really pretty damn good businesses. The Wall Street Journal. Yet his departure from the company cements the triumph of operations over design at Apple, a fundamental shift from a business driven by hardware wizardry to one focused on maintaining profit margins and leveraging Apple's past hardware successes to sell software and services. There's a story from 2010 when Apple introduced the iPad. It went like this. Only Steve and Johnny could make the iPad, but only Tim could figure out how to sell it for $500. Again, I'll refer everyone back to last week's show with Mei Lee, who worked on the original iPhone during the Jobs era and other projects after Steve had passed away, for a first-hand account of how operations has always supported design at Apple. Because it had to. From the Wall Street Journal, Mr. Cook, an industrial engineer who made his name perfecting Apple's supply chain, sought to keep Mr. Ive happy over the years. But people in the design studio rarely saw Mr. Cook, who they say showed little interest in the product development process, a fact that dispirited Mr. Ive. It's interesting to read about disconnects at the top, the drama and dilemmas, and Tim Cook trying to keep Johnny Ive happy over the years all at the same time. And there certainly must have been something terrifying and energizing knowing Steve Jobs would be descending on the ID studio for his regular check-in, everyone racing to get everything ready to show him. But to the surprise of absolutely no one, Cook isn't Jobs any more than Ive is Cook, something they all knew and appreciated deeply, which is why Apple had them both. That said, 
It is fun to watch the reactions when Cook pauses to describe the intricacies of a staircase at an Apple store or grabs an iPad Pro from someone in marketing to give a spur of the moment full on demo to a special guest in the hands on area. It's almost as though what he apparently lacks in attention to design, he makes up for in attention to design. The Wall Street Journal said, Mr. Ive grew frustrated as Apple's board became increasingly populated by directors with backgrounds in finance and operations rather than technology or other areas of the company's core business, said people close to him and to the company. Arthur Levinson of Genentech, Ronald Sugar of Northrop Grumman, Andrea Young, formerly of Avon, now of Grammy in America, and Al Gore, former Vice President of the United States, joined the board during the Jobs era and remain on it today, as does Tim Cook, who joined just before Jobs passed away. Robert Iger of Disney joined a very short time later. Since then, Bill Campbell of Intuit retired in 2014 and Miller Drexler of J. Crew in 2015. Apple did replace their software and retail experience with two new finance-centric directors in James Bell of Boeing and Susan Wagner of BlackRock. But it was also after a series of controversies from non-poaching agreements to stock backdating and a period of rapid financial activity, including a 7 to 1 stock split in 2014 and the launch of a massive repurchasing and dividend program. The Wall Street Journal. The country's most valuable company for years, Apple recently ceded top status to Microsoft Corp and its stock remains 15% below its record high in October. Apple stock is 15% below its record high which was just eight months ago, not back during the Steve Jobs era or when the iPad launched or before Johnny went off to work on Apple Park, but while Apple was supposedly rudderless, filled with drama and in the midst of a dilemma. According to the Wall Street Journal, a person who worked closely with Mr. I for many years said Apple employees who were newer see that, oh wow, Johnny has gone away a bit, but I don't look at it as him being distant. After many product releases over the years, including the iMac and iPhone, this person said Mr. Ive took time to recharge, adding that the company tried to create a different model where the designer could work remotely more often. The reality was he worked just as hard and got just as tired. This far better matches what I and other people who cover Apple closely have heard. It would have been great to hear more of this admittedly less sensational perspective throughout. Back to the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Ive was devastated by Mr. Jobs' death. The studio's cadence slowed. The former goes without saying. The latter is hard to reconcile. Even if we leave out all the software, including the massive iOS 7 redesign and the launch of watchOS, tvOS, and just now iPadOS, and focus only on the industrial design side, that still leaves the Apple Watch, the original iPad Pro and Apple Pencil, the new Apple TV, iPhone 5, iPhone Plus models, AirPods, HomePods, iPhone 10 and the 2015 MacBook, 2016 MacBook Pro, 2018 MacBook Air, and the 2018 iPad Pro and Apple Pencil, and the new Mac Pro and Pro Display. If anything, the scale and cadence have only escalated over the last eight years. The Wall Street Journal said, Mr. Ive had begun pushing to make a watch. He was intrigued by the potential to further miniaturize the iPhone's powerful technology into a wearable device. Some executives pushed back, questioning if a device so small could ever have a killer app that would compel people to buy it. But this is exactly how product development works at Apple. There were two purple projects, P1, an iPod phone led by Tony Fidel, and P2, an OS X phone led by Scott Forstall. P1 never shipped. P2 became the iPhone. Steve Jobs didn't believe in the iPad mini. Eddie Q fought for it and eventually Steve relented and said they'd do it, but it was Eddie's fault if it failed. A thousand no's for every yes isn't make-believe. Everything is considered and reconsidered, factored and refactored, tested and retested. If no one had pushed back, it literally wouldn't have been Apple. The Wall Street Journal. He disagreed over how to position the watch with some Apple leaders who wanted to sell it as an extension of the iPhone. Mr. Ive saw it as a fashion accessory. The result was a compromise. The watch was electronically tethered to the iPhone and started at 349. Apple also created a $17,000 gold version and partnered with Hermes. Here's a thunker. What could the first couple of Apple Watches have done if they weren't paired with iPhones? Not even tell time in the precise Mickey foot tapping way they were designed to do, much less express the power of the iPhone in an even smaller package the way we just heard Johnny wanted them to do. 
Like early iPods and iPhones that had to sync with a PC to do much of anything, the Apple Watch was just too highly constrained to handle even basic computing functions on its own, and it's safe to say everyone knew it. There were certainly disagreements about which specific features it should and shouldn't ship with, and frankly, there probably should have been more given the lack of focus of the first generation. But again, it's the kind of argument we all want people inside Apple to have. The fashion aspect though, is what got the Apple Watch attention beyond just the computer industry and early adopters. It was different than iPod fashion, which tweaked colors and designs at the low end almost every holiday shopping season. This was high-end fashion, something that got fashion press to the events and got Apple Watch into Vogue and other fashion magazines and onto the wrists of celebrities and the conversations of the culture. The gold Apple Watch was quickly retired, but the Hermes one persists to this day as does the Nike one. Because as we've seen over the last few years, it's the fitness and now health features that have given it that clarity of purpose, that have given it those killer apps. Back to the Wall Street Journal. Mr. Ive told Mr. Cook he wanted to step back from the day-to-day -day management responsibilities. The staff beneath him had ballooned to hundreds of people. He didn't want to leave, but wanted time and space to think, he told several people. This again resonates with me and is in line with what I've also heard. But again, this simple rationality just doesn't get as much ink as the insinuations of drama. It's easy to look back and say that following the death of Steve Jobs, Johnny Ive leaving Apple was inevitable. But does that mean Apple has spent the last eight years carefully orchestrating and managing that departure? Or has everyone involved spent that time doing everything they could to try to stave off that inevitability? The Wall Street Journal. Ahead of one design week in 2016, Johnny Manzari, who was in charge of Apple's camera app, stood before more than a dozen 11 inch by 17 inch images of changes he planned to pitch when word trickled through the studio that Mr. Ive wasn't gonna come. What am I gonna do now, Mr. Manzari said. Now, it's weird to see a non-executive name dropped in an article like this. As far as I can recall, or Google can tell, Manzari has only ever been in the press once before, when he joined Phil Schiller to talk about portrait lighting with BuzzFeed in 2017. When I do see something like this, it always feels kind of dirty, like some servicing of agenda or settling of accounts. Otherwise, why grant everyone else anonymity, but not this one fairly obscure person? Who gains from that, and what do they gain? Also, according to people directly familiar with the matter, this anecdote is completely false anyway, which only makes it curiouser. Now, I'm gonna skip ahead here, otherwise this will end up being as long as my Catalina video, and nobody wants that, nobody. The journal ends on this. Mr. Ives' old design team, a group of athletes once thought as gods inside Apple, will report to COO Jeff Williams, a mechanical engineer with an MBA. Johnny Ives' old design team reports to Evans Hankey, a longtime member of the team who, according to everyone I've ever spoken with, and to quote Mei Lee from last week's show, gets stuff done. In other words, she's a force of nature. Evans reports to Jeff Williams, just like before Johnny's brief return to day-to-day -day management, she and before her, Richard Howorth, and before and between them, technically Johnny himself, reported to Tim Cook, an industrial engineer with an MBA. But with Sabiq Khan now taking over as Senior Vice President of Operations at Apple, it's best to think of Jeff Williams being more like what Tim Cook became to Steve Jobs, a compliment. In this case, someone to run product, at least for now, who knows, as we begin the era at least partially after Johnny Ive. And I don't think any of that is especially hard to see, unless of course you need simple contacts. No more appointments, no more waiting rooms, no more overpaying. Simple Contacts brings a doctor's office to wherever you are, whenever you need it, so you can skip the office visit, but not the care. And if you have an unexpired prescription, just upload a photo of it or your doctor's info and order your lenses in minutes for a great price. They do all the hard work for you. Here's how it works. Using your phone or computer, you can take the simple contacts vision test in five minutes from literally anywhere, your couch, your office, the airport, anywhere. Then a real doctor reviews your test in 24 hours, and if your vision hasn't changed, writes you a new prescription. And boom, a fresh supply of your brand of lenses is on its way to your door. Best of all, you get $20 off your first Simple Contacts order just by going to simplecontacts.com vector20 or entering vector20 at checkout. This isn't a replacement for your periodic full eye health exam. You still need that, but it is the most convenient way to renew a prescription and reorder your contacts if your vision hasn't changed. 
Again, get $20 off your first Simple Contacts order just by going to simplecontacts.com slash Vector20 or entering Vector20 at checkout. Now, Tim Cook's response to the Wall Street Journal article pulled no punches. The story is absurd. A lot of the reporting and certainly the conclusions just don't match with reality. At a base level, it shows a lack of understanding about how the design team works and how Apple works. It distorts relationships, decisions, and events to the point that we just don't recognize the company it claims to describe. The design team is phenomenally talented. As Johnny has said, they're stronger than ever, and I have complete confidence that they will thrive under Jeff Evans and Alan's leadership. We know the truth, and we know the incredible things they're capable of doing. The projects they're working on will blow you away. It's incredibly rare for Tim Cook to so publicly rebut a story. Most of the time, when faced with what they consider to be negative, even false press, Apple will typically just stay quiet, and that's usually a good strategy. Wait a day and another sensational story will come up and our ever-shortening attention spans will just spin around and take momentary distraction in that instead. When Apple or Tim Cook does speak out though, it keeps the story going in the news cycle and it ups the stakes considerably by putting Tim Cook's name, reputation, and credibility on the line. He becomes the story. The last time Apple responded this forcefully was when Bloomberg published its big hack story claiming Apple, Amazon, and many other companies were running servers that had been compromised at a hardware level by Chinese intelligence. Bloomberg has stuck by that story even as independent audits have come back showing no evidence or support for it at all. But why do it in this case? I think many people, especially inside Apple, probably read the journal story as a hit piece. On the eve of Johnny Ive leaving Apple after 30 years of service, 30 years that reshaped not just the company, but the entire industry, they read it as an effort by a few frustrated, thirsty, disenfranchised individuals to paint Ive as having abandoned his peers and his team, and as a consequence having failed to keep the magic or success of Steve Jobs alive. And for many in the company, that's not only ridiculous, but reprehensible. They're not allowed to speak publicly on Apple's behalf, but Tim Cook certainly can. And by sending that email, rather than this story simply becoming accepted as fact and woven into urban legend, they make sure that email dogs it with every reference and in every B-roll, every time it gets regurgitated now and into the future. Whether you ultimately choose to believe the journal's account or Cook's, or you recognize that simple narratives seldom if ever capture the true complexity of human relationships is of course entirely up to you. But I'd love to know what you do think now, at the end of all this. So hit like if you do, subscribe if you haven't already, and then hit up the comments and give me your coldest of cold takes. Thank you so much for watching and see you next video.